How would one spend a few days as a tourist in the Swedish capital Stockholm? Well, I got to spend two days, actually two nights in Stockholm recently. And here is this midlifer's short adventures in the Swedish capital. First, some background. I was on a quick trip to Finland and decided to take a break in Stockholm. My challenge was that I didn't have much time for the trip. I actually had only four nights, but I had to make the best out of this short trip and I wanted to go to Stockholm. So this was my plan. Leave Toronto in the evening, arrive in Stockholm the following afternoon, spend two nights, leave for Helsinki by overnight ferry, reach Helsinki the following morning, spend the day and night in Helsinki and leave the following afternoon. I could have ditched the ferry ride for a flight and spent more time in either Stockholm or Helsinki. But in the true midlifer spirit, I wanted to enjoy the 17 hour ferry experience as well. There are three options to reach Stockholm city center by public transit. The Alanda Express, the slower commuter train and the buses. I wanted to take the Arlanda Express which was expensive but takes just 15 minutes to reach the city center. It costs 340 Swedish kroner which is just over 33 US dollars but for two people it's only 45 USD. And according to the hotel and Google Maps it's just a 10 minute walk from the central station to my hotel. Getting the ticket was easy and a few minutes later I was rolling towards the city. It was one of the fastest trains I had taken as it inched past the 190 km per hour limit. From the central station, the T Central, it wasn't difficult to find the hotel. After freshening up and a short break, I was ready to experience Stockholm. My first stop was a Nobel Prize Museum. The museum is located in the old town, that is Gamla Stern section of the city and it was within walking distance from my hotel. The museum is an interesting place to experience. There are replicas of devices and equipment that some of the laureates used in their research, including microscopes and research papers. There are also artifacts like notebooks and typewriters that some laureates used for inspiration. I found the model of the DNA as well as the copy of the famous Photo 51 which is the X-ray diffraction image of the first DNA double helix structure. Afterwards, it was time for a stroll through Gamla Stern. One could certainly say the heart of the area is the Stortoriet, the oldest square in Stockholm with a rich history dating back to the 15th century. With cobblestone adorned narrow streets and squares, it was an ideal walker's paradise. One could casually stroll around, absorbing the sights and sounds of the area. And in the center of the center is the Stortoriet Brunnen well. It served as an important source of water for the residents and authorities for many centuries. An interesting fact about this well. At one point in time, this was point zero for the city with all places measured in terms of distance from this point. Gamla Stern is home to many important buildings including the royal palace, the parliament and the cathedral. There are also souvenir shops and restaurants all full of people enjoying the sights and sounds of the summer and the city. I had two more items on my bucket list to see and enjoy in the old town. First, the alley of Merth and Trotzi, Stockholm's narrowest street, just under 3 feet or 90 centimeters wide at its narrowest point. It's actually a thoroughfare connecting two streets with 36 steps.
The second item on my list was the Iron Boy. At 6 inches in height, he is the city's smallest statue. Made of iron, he is also called the boy who looks at the moon. He is seated with his legs pulled up and arms around them while looking up. Perched on a long small table, he is much beloved as there are often coins gifted to him. Sometimes, particularly during the cold months, people wrap warm clothes around him. And then it was time for dinner. My initial plan was to go to Pelican for some Swedish dishes. But it had been a long day and I had to take the public transit. So I stayed in the area. And here is my all Swedish dinner. The next day, which was the first and the only full day, first it was time for a breakfast. I love European breads, buns and cured meats. I had a multigrain bun with ham and cheese and coffee to go with it. Then it was time for my first adventure. Stockholm has an impressive 100 subway stations, connecting its three lines, identified by their colors. Along the stations, they have installed artwork, which is currently considered the longest in the world. So, I decided to check some of them out. And after some research, I zeroed in on five stations. The Östermalm Storia station is one of the deepest in the system, located beneath one of the poshest area of the city. The simple sketch-like artworks belong to several artists, with the prominent theme being peace, equality and humanity. Next was the Stadion station, also on the red line. This station was built in 1973 and is one of the first so-called cave stations. That is, it's built directly into the bedrock without the smooth concrete finishes that subway stations usually have. As a result, you can see exposed rock which raised concerns that some people would associate these with netherworld and other nasty places. So a group of artists came up with the idea of creating a rainbow artwork to brighten up and show that there is indeed a sky above the station. North of the Stadion Station on the red line is the Techniska Hochskolen or the Royal Institute of Technology. So, the station obviously reflects what is above, technology. There are technology related symbols, figures, etc. My final station was the Kungsträdgården. This is currently the eastern termination point of the blue line. Kungsträdgården means the King's Garden. It was a royal garden between the 17th and 19th century and now is a public park. The artwork underground reflects what is above the earth. The red, white and green colors mirror the old style formal French gardens. And the sculptures around the station are from the exterior artwork of the former king whose royal garden this was. The station is also known for another uniqueness. It's the only place in northern Europe where a cave dwelling spider species can be found. Some say the spiders piggybacked on equipment brought from southern Europe to build the station. I didn't have much time to explore more of the stations as I had to get my lunch and then get to the boat terminal at 2 pm for a tour of the Stockholm archipelago. But I decided to combine my lunch with a tour of the one of the food halls or marketplaces which are called the Salu halls and I chose the one in Östermalm. After a few minutes of walking from the namesake subway station, you can't miss the historic building on a corner. As I entered, I was mesmerized by all the foods there, from bread and cheese to fresh seafood, meats, cured meat and sweets. There was food everywhere. And then there were the restaurants. I arrived just before 12 pm and the place was getting crowded. For my lunch, I decided to try herring, another Swedish dish. And my dish consisted of five different types of herring dishes. And then there was crepe cheese, potatoes, a hard brown cracker bread, and of course the lindenberry. berry. 
Later, I wanted to stroll around the area, but as I mentioned, I had to be at the dock for the boat, so I just took a walk to the boat terminal. The archipelago tour started on time. Fanning into the Baltic Sea, the Stockholm archipelago encompasses up to 30,000 islands of varying sizes, from a single boulder jutting out of the water to fairly sized islands. It covers an area of more than 1,600 square kilometers. So now we've turned in around number 18 on the map, Tegelian or the Greek Island here. And the Swedes are naturally immensely proud of this natural wonder. And many movies and books have been set on some of these islands. Some of these islands were initially inhabited by fisher folk. But eventually, wealthy Stockholmers built their summer houses to escape the rather uncomfortable living conditions during the summer in the city. Since the end of World War II, they have become more egalitarian. The landscape is rich in flora and fauna with seabirds, seals and much more. Some of the islands are dotted with traditional wooden homes. There are then these bigger islands like Waxholm and Sunham, where you could walk around and have some fantastic seafood meals and much more. There are also lighthouses and fortresses. To be honest, you would need a few days to experience this archipelago fully, but I was short on time. For people like me, there are few tour options and I chose a two and a half hour tour with a guide as I thought it would be nice to learn more about the islands dotting the landscape. After my return, it was time for fika, coffee time in Swedish, and the Swedes are very passionate about their fika. It was kind of late at 4.30, but coffee time it was. After the fika and some freshening up, it was time for more exploration. I just stumbled around. My hotel was in Norman, which is the city center and therefore the busiest. Stockholm was enjoying a four-day annual culture festival and the area was beyond lively. There were several stages with various musical performances and thousands of people were enjoying themselves. Having tasted so many different dishes, I wanted something with rice for dinner. Earlier, I had a Brazilian snack at one of the stands by a stage, but obviously that wasn't enough. So close to the Thai Central, I found this food center and ordered a Thai Malaysian dish. And later of course a few churros. After returning to the hotel, I took a break and then walked back towards the stages. It was an incredible sight. Even at 11 p.m., there was at least one stage with live music and people were dancing and drinking happily. And then it was the final day of my very short trip to Stockholm. After breakfast, I took my longest trip on public transit. I wanted to see the Per Albin houses. The 94 houses in Bromma are a classic example of Swedish functionalism. They were built in the 1930s to provide affordable, high-quality houses for working-class people and were called Forshemmet or the people's homes. The mind behind this housing scheme was the long-term Prime Minister Per Albin Hansson. Now, however, this area is considered an affluent neighborhood. Built at an angle, all the pastel-colored houses look the same except for one where the former Prime Minister had lived. And this house had an arched exterior on the side. I didn't want to hang around too much and take too many photos or videos because these houses are currently occupied. Well, I had a few more hours before I got to the 
ferry terminal to take the ferry to Helsinki. I had time for my lunch and I wanted it to be very typical Swedish. So what could be more typical Swedish than a meatball and mashed potatoes lunch at IKEA, the furniture and household items giant that started in Sweden. There's a massive IKEA store at the Galerian Mall located close to my hotel. The store was crowded and I had to wait for more than 30 minutes to get my lunch. But the wait was worth it. It was a simple and delicious lunch. There's something magical about the gravy. Thick, velvety and tasty. Afterwards, I walked back to the hotel to collect my luggage and take a cab to the ferry terminal. Well, here are some final comments of my two-night short trip to the Swedish capital Stockholm. English is widely spoken in the capital city. In fact, sometimes I forgot that I was in a non-English speaking country. And that gave me pants of guilt because I wasn't trying to learn at least a few words in the local language. I simply loved that the areas I was in were so lively with people. But it could also be because it was summer and Stockholm was hosting the culture festival. It would be interesting to know what the city is like in winter. Most cafes and malls offer free Wi-Fi. In some areas, I saw the Stockholm guest Wi-Fi account, but I couldn't sign in. I was also told that Te Centralen has Wi-Fi as well, but I never tried. I subscribed to a European regional eSIM account, so I was covered during my transit in Iceland and then in Stockholm and Finland. Sweden is a near cashless society, though their central bank is calling for the quote unquote strengthening of the government's role in ensuring cash is accepted. I used a credit card that doesn't charge foreign transaction fees. So usually whenever I travel, I transfer the cash in advance to that credit card account and then use it. Had I had more time, I would have considered taking a train ride to the north from where I could have crossed the border to Finland and then taken the train to Helsinki. But as I mentioned, I just had two nights. All in all, it was a very worthwhile short trip. That's it for this edition of the adventuresofmidlife.com video blog. I hope you enjoyed my adventures in the Swedish capital Stockholm for just over two days. I hope to see you again. Thank you for watching. Ciao.